Hey, thank you again for joining. Um, hopefully you're, we're talking about building fires today, talking about um, readiness, response, and uh, recovery. A few really quick housekeeping items. Um, this webinar is being recorded. Um, all participants are currently muted. So if you do have questions, if you can post questions in the Q&A section, um, we'll be monitoring that and answering all questions um, at the end of the session. Uh, I am pleased today to introduce Dr. Felicia Gaither, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Field Operations in Public and Indian Housing at HUD. Dr. Gaither and her staff have been pivotal in advocating for PHAs before and when disasters strike. This webinar series and training is just one example of that work. Dr. Gaither, go ahead. Alrighty, thank you. Good morning to those um, that are not on the East Coast and good afternoon to those on the East Coast and in the middle of the country. I'd like to thank you today for joining the final webinar in the PHA Disaster Readiness, Response, and Recovery webinar series. This is number six of six for our team. This webinar series directly aligns with HUD and White House priorities to equitably improve the nation's disaster recovery, <clears throat> excuse me, and building long-term inclusive resilience to the impacts of climate change, particularly for historically marginalized communities. We know that vulnerable communities bear the brunt of natural disasters, and our goal with this webinar series was to ensure that your PHA is ready to respond to and recover from any disaster that may impact your families and the properties that you are responsible for. In our first five webinars, we discussed hurricanes, extreme temperatures, wildfires, tornadoes, and flooding. In this final webinar, we will discuss the impacts and risks posed by residential building fires. In recent years, we've seen the residential building fires pose an increasing risk to HUD-assisted families and properties across the country. Tragically, some of these recent fires have resulted in displacements and fatalities. Many of these fires are preventable, and our webinar today will outline some of these prevention strategies. Our goal is to stop building fires before they happen. And this webinar is a step in that direction. To get on the ground PHA perspective, today you will hear from Cheryl Douglas, the executive director of the Ogdensburg Housing Authority on her PHA's readiness, response and recovery from a recent fire that impacted her housing authority. You will also hear from Mr. Ted Jankowski, a retired New York fire chief and Barbara Berg, a PHA risk management specialist. We want to thank Cheryl, Ted, and Barbara for sharing their knowledge and experiences with us today. Again, I thank you for participating in this webinar series and being ready to respond to, uh, to any disaster or event that is coming your way. So thanks again, and I will turn it back over to Jody. Thank you, Felicia. Um, as, as you just heard, this is the final in a webinar in a series of webinars um, on disaster re readiness, response, and recovery. Um, all of the webinars can be found on um, the HUD exchange, um, including this one. As we go through the presentation, you will see um, different hyperlinks uh, throughout. And so this one, for example, you'll be able to click on this and, and get to all of the webinars in this series. Um, this webinar will be posted generally within about a week, a week and available on the HUD Exchange. So this series introduces um, PHA disaster readiness, response, and recovery planning. We also wanted to let you know that the PHA disaster readiness and preparation guide is currently being updated and will include new sections on roles and responsibilities, communications, short and long-term housing options, recovery timelines, funding strategies, and financial management. This new guide 
along with a series of one page fact sheets um, are currently being developed and they should be released within the next couple of months. This webinar series and the updated guide provides a lot of resources for housing authorities to support them in their planning um, for being prepared and ready to respond to any disaster. So we do have a very full agenda today talking about um, building fires. Uh, we have a quick overview on building fires. We will be discussing inspections, um, hazard mitigation and resilience. We, of course, will discuss disaster readiness related to building fires, um, how to respond. Uh, we will hear from Cheryl Douglas from Ogdensburg, New York. And, and finally, we will discuss recovering from a building fire. During this webinar, we will share ideas and best practices for housing authorities to consider when developing uh, your emergency response plans um, and accept where indicated. These are suggested best practices um, and not HUD, HUD mandates um, unless they're called out specifically. I'd like to introduce our presenters for today. Fred Tombar is a nationally recognized expert in housing and disaster recovery. He has been appointed to advise presidents, HUD and Homeland Security secretaries, and governors during his more than 25 year career. Ted Jankowski spent more than two decades with the New York Fire Department, overseeing a citywide safety and inspection services command and retiring as deputy chief. After that, he became the public safety director in Stamford, Connecticut, where he oversaw municipal functions related to police, fire, health, social services, rescue, emergency medical services, and emergency management. Cheryl Douglas is the executive director of Ogdensburg PHA, she has over 25 years of housing authority experience, including serving as executive director at Messina uh, Housing Authority before becoming the executive director at Ogdensburg three years ago. And Barbara Berg recently retired after working for a large public housing authority for 38 years. For 28 of those years, she worked in expanded responsibilities of insurance, risk control and risk management. And she enjoys training staff about risk management because most business decisions include some level of risk. So thank you to all of our presenters for being with us today. Now let's talk a little about building fires. Just really super quickly, um, leading causes of building fires to be thinking about as we go through all of our planning today. Cooking is the leading cause of residential building fires. Um, and many cooking fires come from unattended cooking where grease or oil um, ignites, or if there are flammable materials near burners that catch fire. The number of these fires can be reduced by emphasizing the importance of vigilance while cooking and um, reminding residents uh, how to be safe while cooking. Heating is the second leading cause of residential fires, including central heating, fireplaces, portable space heaters, fixed room heaters, wood stoves, and water heating. So a few of the other causes are also listed here. Each year in the United States, there are an estimated 368,000 residential building fires. That's a really big number and results in quite a few deaths, almost 3,000 deaths annually, um, 11, over 11,000 injuries and $8.1 billion in property loss, um, which just really does highlight uh, the importance of what we're doing here today. So really quickly, if we look back to um, 
the common causes of, uh, of building fires, you can see um, why, when they most frequently occur um, is during the hours of 5 to 8 p.m. when people are typically cooking their evening meal and also in the months of December and January, which is related to uh, the heat cause of fires. So um, we are going to talk a little bit about inspections. And for that, I will turn over to Fred Tombar. Fred? Thank you, Jody. HUD uh, has inspection requirements relative to fire safety. Um, and uh, just to talk a little bit about those, uh, it's a, a best practice to regularly monitor not just the uh, HUD federal requirements, but also your state and local fire code requirements for updates to ensure that your public housing agency is in compliance. Um, in addition, uh, there are uh, HUD inspection requirements that you would need to comply with. The first is that every building must provide uh, some alternate means of exit in case of a fire, such as fire stairs or egress through windows. Uh, in terms of smoke detectors, uh, the housing quality standards uh, for housing choice voucher units requires that smoke detectors uh, be in working condition and located on every level of, of the rental unit. The uh, UPCS uh, requirements for public housing uh, are the same mirror those as HQS requirements for, for smoke detectors, one on every level of the, of the uh, unit. In terms of carbon monoxide alarms or uh, detectors, uh, they must be installed in all public housing, uh, HCV and uh, project-based voucher units by December 27th of this year. And that's a requirement under the HUD notice uh, uh, 22-01 uh, that's linked here. Uh, and throughout this, uh, this presentation, there are links to some of the requirements that we identify. And these slides will be made available uh, after our training here today. I want to talk a little bit about the uh, pending INSPIRE requirements that are, have been proposed uh, by uh, the, the INSPIRE or the National Standard for the Physical Inspection of Real Estate uh, requirements or proposed standards from HUD that will replace both HQS and UPCS. Uh, INSPIRE's fire safety requirements uh, that are proposed recommend um, uh, one uh, method of egress, which includes a safe, uh, continuous, and unobstructed path of travel from any point in a building, a unit, or structure to get out of the building. Uh, smoke alarms must be installed on every level and inside the uh, difference here is that in, inside of each sleeping area, uh, that is to conform with the National Fire Protection Association standards that are linked here as well. And then uh, carbon monoxide alarms must conform with the 2018 International Fire Code, which is linked here as well. Uh, fire label doors must be fully functioning and oper operable. And then finally, sprinkler heads must be functional and unobstructed. Good day, everyone. This is uh, Ted Jankowski. And thank you so much for joining this webinar. Uh, building fires are, are such a, a dangerous uh, thing to, uh, to experience. And, I'm glad everybody's here to, to learn how to prepare for, how to respond to, how to recover from fires, and really to, uh, to see if there's any mitigation that can be, uh, can be performed. So thanks again for everybody for joining this webinar. Uh, but fire inspections are, are basically conducted annually for multiple dwellings. Multiple dwellings are buildings that are, have three apartments or more, and the type and frequency of the inspections vary depending on the location of the building, the installation, any relevant laws, local and special regulations that are applicable to the type of building occupancy that you will have in your, your PHA. But some of the things that will be checked by the fire inspectors when they come around, and they should be coming around annually, but sometimes uh, there's a, a heavy burden 
Uh, sometimes those inspections are, are delayed, but they will get to you as soon as possible. And it's so important to uh, to, to be prepared and to work with the, uh, the fire marshal's office or the fire department. Some of the things that uh, they will come to uh, to look at, and I always look at the fire inspections, and this is how the PHA should also look at it, that it's a six-sided approach towards uh, inspections. And, and when I say a six-sided approach, there's the the top or above, there's below, and then there's the four sides within the building, uh, but then there's also the exterior of the building. So the first thing is the visibility of the building address from the street. In my career, I've uh, responded to, to buildings that were not identified there was a delay in the response and and that's something that we want to uh, to avoid and it seems so basic but please make sure that the building is uh, identified with uh, with proper proper numbering the fire department is going to come they're going to uh, to look to make sure that they have access to the interior of the building for emergency responders and this is uh, in, important because if you can't get in uh, and you can't get in easily again there's going to uh, to be a time delay and, and that's something that we want to avoid because when a fire does occur uh, it does grow quickly and it does grow exponentially. So the sooner that the fire department can get there, uh, the better it is. And that's why these inspections are so important. Fire sprinkler rises. A lot of buildings have fire sprinklers. It's important to make sure that they are functioning. Uh, fire sprinklers are so important to, uh, to making sure that a fire is contained. And uh, that's probably one of the, the number one fire protection systems that I would recommend for PHAs. Having an alarm panel, uh, a central alarm, uh, it's important because it will give information to the fire department when they come to the scene, but it's also an early warning device for residents within the, the building. And then they'll make sure that there's annual maintenance are uh, performed throughout the building, especially on the fire protection systems. They'll come, they'll look at your fire extinguishers, they'll check the inspection dates, uh, make sure that they are up to, uh, up to date in terms of being uh, charged and, and tested, et cetera. Fire door functionality. Now this is something that's so important uh, because I've seen throughout my career when fire doors are not, not uh, operating properly, they're not self-closing or uh, they're propped open, uh, there's a lot of times that we'll have some fatalities that are, are one, two or several floors uh, above the fire. So making sure that these doors uh, function properly is so important, especially to the fire department itself, because if that door is left open, the, the products of the, the fire, uh, the heat, the smoke, uh, it's going to travel throughout the, uh, the building itself. So please make sure that you, uh, you look at, at the fire door functionality, uh, that they're self-closing for the stairs, the apartments, uh, the compact, the rooms, et cetera. And then exit and emergency lighting. And that's something I'm going to discuss a little bit in more detail with this, uh, the, the next slide. Uh, but exit and emergency lighting is important. And then the exit doors, both functional and un unobstructed. The worst thing that can happen to uh, an individual is that they're, they're, they're panicked. They're trying to get out of the building. Uh, and then an exit door is not functioning or it is obstructed. So uh, just minor, minor housekeeping. And a lot of times it's common sense, but you know it's something that we need to uh, to remind everybody of. And then access to the services, to the electrical boxes, to to the breakers, uh, to the gas and the water service. Uh, if they have easy access uh, to those locations, it can prevent further damage in uh, as a result of a fire, especially if a sprinkler system is going off or a broken pipe, etc. And then evacuation plan. I cannot stress enough. This is something that is so important, making sure that there's a, a fire safety plan and evacuation evacuation plan that's hung in a conspicuous location. My recommendation is to make sure that each apartment has an evacuate, evacuation plan. Uh, it should be hung on the back of the apartment doors. It should be on every floor level. It should be in the lobby and any other common, common spaces. Next slide. Now, this is something that, that's important, and we dedicated a, a slide to this because it is so important. Uh, the method, methods of egress. Exits are continuously maintained free of all ob obstructions. Again, something I mentioned before, when somebody's panicked and they're trying to get out, uh, if that exit is uh, obstructed, uh, it's the worst thing that somebody can, uh, can encounter. And uh, so we want to make sure that they are not obstructed. No storage and exit access corridors or exit enclosures. Many times throughout my career, I've been uh, been doing an inspection, and then you'll you'll actually see that they use the exits as as storage areas, and uh, something that you you cannot do. It, it's dangerous and it, it could cost a, a life. 
uh, those exits being continuously illuminated. That's something that's so important because you want individuals when they do have to evacuate the building that they can evacuate and they can evacuate safely. And then bedrooms. Uh, hopefully there, there are fire escapes on your, your PHA buildings uh, as a secondary means of egress. And again, that secondary means of egress should be unimpeded. Uh, if it provides any type of impedance, again, that could, uh, could cause a, a fatality. And that's something that we, uh, we definitely want to avoid. And then the evacuation procedures. I mentioned this before. Uh, very, very important. And there are two types of, of buildings out there in terms of construction. Uh, there are non-fireproof buildings uh, where the structural uh, components are combustible. They will burn as well as the content. So that's something there are a lot of buildings that are, that are out there. Uh, when a building burns, it's definitely a different type of fire safety plan and evacuation in terms of how to get out of a building as compared to a, a fireproof building. And a fireproof building is a building that's non-combustible, meaning the structural components of the building uh, will not go on fire. However, in those, those type of, of buildings, the components uh, within the, the structure or within the apartment, that's what provides for the, uh, the fire load. So I recommend uh, to, to, to all the PHAs, know what type of building you have uh, so that this way you can make sure of fire safety plans, make sure of your uh, methods of egress, and you can remind your, your residents of exactly how they should be uh, operating in case there is a fire within their buildings. And in a fireproof building, and you're gonna see with Ogden, uh, Ogdensburg, uh, they actually operated correctly based on their plans uh, with their methods of egress, uh, et cetera. So uh, I will be discussing this further. Uh, again, later on, you can ask questions regarding the methods of egress. Uh, and I will now turn it over to Barbara. I'm sorry, back to Fred. Yes, thank you. I want to talk a little bit about hazard mitigation. Uh, first of all, uh, it's important to define just what do we mean by hazard mitigation. Uh, hazard mitigation is an effort to reduce the loss of life and property by lessening the impact of any type of disaster. Related to hazard mitigation is resilience. Uh, resilience is different in that it is uh, defined as the ability to adapt to uh, withstand a ra uh, rapidly recover from a disaster or any type of catastrophic event. So why is it that mitigation is important? Well, first uh, it's uh, hard to predict when a building fire will happen. It can happen at any time or you know, uh, in any place. And uh, the, the loss of life, the financial impacts uh, the, uh, to loss to, and damage to property are also hard to predict. Um, fire prevention uh, is critical to mitigating the potential impacts by avoiding fire altogether if possible. Um, and mitigation projects can reduce the impact if a fire does in fact occur. There are a few ways that uh, HUD uh, identifies for funding some mitigation projects uh, through PHAs. One is to use the capital fund program. The other is to use your PHAs uh, operating funds. There's also available to you the operating fund financing program and the capital fund financing program. In particular for uh, carbon monoxide detectors, um, uh, there is the capital fund safety and security set aside, which we link here um, and uh, in notice, uh, PIH notice 202205. Um, I will caution you that though uh, there are funds available for the purchase and replacement and inst installation of carbon monoxide detectors, um, those are limited. And so uh, if you're interested, you should uh, look at that notice and talk to folks in your field office. I'll turn it to uh, Ted to talk about some mitigation ideas you might consider. Thank you, Fred. So mitigation ideas, that's something that I had mentioned before. Again, uh, PHAs should know how to prepare, 
prepare for, respond to, recover from, and then really consider some mitigation ideas. And, and the mitigation ideas are going to, uh, to, to reduce the severity of a building fire if, uh, if it should occur. Uh, some of the, uh, the areas that we're, we're going to uh, discuss is how important new smoke and carbon monoxide detectors are, uh, making sure that they're tamper-proof, uh, meaning that the battery cannot be removed. And I think everybody in this webinar has seen where somebody uh, has removed the battery for one reason or another, uh, especially if it's, that, that it's, it's just that one battery, it's beeping, it's showing that the battery needs to be replaced. A lot of times people will, uh, will take that battery, battery out. So we wanna make sure that the, uh, the smoke detectors and the carbon monoxide detectors are tamper-proof and that battery cannot be uh, removed because in a fire, uh, senses, especially if you're sleeping, your senses go to sleep. So the only thing that can, can alert you of a, a fire and the residents uh, is a properly op operating smoke or carbon monoxide detector. And that's why it's so uh, so important. But they should be lo located, I believe Fred mentioned this, each level uh, inside the bedrooms, outside of the bedroom areas, carbon monoxide detectors on each, uh, each floor level. Uh, and the technology has increased uh, immensely. And I don't know if, if everybody's aware, there are two different types of smoke detectors that are out there. There's the ionization type, and then there's the photoelectric type. The ionization type of smoke detector, it detects a, a flaming fire quicker uh, than a photoelectric, uh, photoelectric smoke detector would. The benefit of, uh, of a photoelectric uh, as compared to an ionization is it detects those smoldering, those slow building fires uh, a lot quicker. And now technology, what they've done is they've actually put together dual carbon monoxide detectors uh, I'm sorry, smoke detectors, where you can have a ionization and a photoelectric. There are companies out there that also have the combined smoke and, and carbon monoxide detectors. So uh, I recommend that the PHAs work with the, the local jurisdictions to see what's acceptable there uh, and, and purchase what, what we consider to be the best, uh, best tools out there for alerting people uh, about fires. What's new, what's new and especially good is that the newer uh, smoke detectors and carbon monoxide detectors, they have a 10 year battery life. And for those of you that, that have been doing this for a while, uh, I think you know that each smoke detector, carbon monoxide detector lifespan is approximately 10 years. So uh, when the battery goes on these, these newer uh, smoke and carbon monoxide detectors, you just take out the old one and replace it. Probably one of the best uh, situations you can have is installed hardwired smoke and carbon monoxide detectors, but you have to make sure that it does have battery backup uh, because when we have power outages, we want to make sure that they are, are still functioning. And then some, some other ideas that are out there. Uh, you did hear mentioned before uh, that a main cause of fires is cooking carelessness. Uh, there is some, some technology out there. It's called a stovetop fire suppressor. It emits a fire extinguishing uh, material uh, similar to, to baking soda that once, uh, once a fire starts, it'll set up a fuse uh, on these suppressors and then you'll have this bicarbonate solution that will uh, put out the fire. The only drawback to this is if you, you have a, a gas fired stove, uh, it may also extinguish the, uh, extinguish the pilot, uh, pilot light allowing gas to, uh, to, to seep through the apartment. So uh, if you're looking at this, and, and again, these are just ideas, uh, ideas that you can, can, can look at. Uh, they're similar to, to what you would see in a commercial kitchen, but a lot less expensive. And, and it's something that, uh, that, that I've seen films of, and it works uh, extremely, uh, extremely well. Uh, something that I had mentioned previously, sprinkler systems, it is the, the best fire safety tool out there. Uh, for extinguishing uh, and making sure that it contains a fire. Uh, if at all possible, that's something uh, that I would consider, consider doing. It is costly, so that's, uh, that's something that you'd have to, to work into your budgets. And then central alarms or pull stations within buildings. Uh, that early, again, early identification, early notification to, uh, to other residents is so important. Uh, that's why that central alarm pull station is, uh, is good. Now, there are low-cost low mitigation ideas that, that I recommend. 
Uh, within your public housing authority, you should have an, an emergency notification system for residents. And the reason why the more information that individuals uh, can be provided with, the safer it is going to, to be for them, uh, especially if it's timely information. A comprehensive fire plan is, uh, is something for, for residents. And, and I go back to, uh, to, to my days in New York City uh, when the city was, was burning and I'm glad we're not at that point, uh, at that point again. Uh, but I remember uh, individuals as I was having them evacuate the building, they would actually tell me, this isn't our first fire. We know exactly what to do. And uh, thank God uh, we don't have as many fires as they used to be. Uh, and that's why we need this comprehensive fire plan. And it's something that we, we need to, to make sure that the residents are, residents are prepared for. Uh, and if we have those fire safety notices on how they're supposed to react, uh, on the, the apartment doors in those common areas, that's going to, uh, to help the residents uh, respond uh, if a fire should occur. And uh, it is a time where people do panic. So if they are, are prepared as best as possible, uh, that's something that's going to, uh, going to, to help them in responding. Uh, the lobby in the common areas, so it's key to have them in there, but again, also on the back of the doors uh, in different languages. And that's something that, that a lot of a lot of people may fail to, uh, to, to really take advantage of, but please make sure that uh, if you have uh, different dialects within your buildings, that you have uh, these fire safety plans out there uh, in the different languages so that this way they will, will under, understand what to, uh, to do. And then kitchen fire protocol for residents, uh, how to react. Uh, I've seen firefighters act inappropriately when it comes to kitchen fire. If you take water and you put it on a, a pan filled with grease, with oil, that will actually turn that, that small fire, which is in a plant, uh, in that, that frying pan, into a ball of fire. And, and that's something you want to, uh, to train them. And believe it or not, the easiest way to extinguish that is that to put a cover on, turn the, uh, the gas off, and, and let it burn itself out. Uh, but a lot, of, uh, a lot of residents do have different types of uh, kitchen fire protocols where they do provide a fire extinguisher. And again, it's a, a, a sodium bicarbonate fire extinguisher. Uh, it's UL listed that's out there. That's something that you could provide to, uh, to, to your residents. We spoke about that fire safety notice. Again, everybody should be aware of the building construction of the uh, fire protection systems within the building, because depending upon your building, if it's fireproof or non-fireproof, that's gonna dictate the, uh, the fire safety plan for the individuals. Something that I, that I had mentioned to, uh, to each, each public housing authority that I've worked with is that they should really know the residents. Uh, when I say know the residents, know if somebody has any type of disabilities, uh, if a person is deaf, and that could actually allow you to provide some more mitigation uh, ideas in terms of uh, smoke and carbon monoxide detectors that have the, the visual strobe lights out there. Uh, and there are some other, uh, other items out there that use, using technology will, will help. Uh, but something that, that really is a detriment to, uh, to residents and public housing authorities and, and actually anywhere is, is hoarding. So if you come across residents when you're, you're in their apartments, if you see a hoarding situation, there is help out there uh, using social services, uh, social services or uh, other, other types of mandated services to, to make sure that that situation is addressed. And I've seen the loss of life with, uh, with apartments where you had an individual who was, uh, was hoarding. And for mitigation ideas, I think everybody, uh, in terms of your maintenance personnel, uh, they should be aware every time they go into an apartment, check for the smoke and carbon monoxide detectors, check to make sure that the, uh, the fire escape is not blocked. Uh, if they do have window, gu window guards, make sure that those window guards are approved. Uh, make sure that fire safety notice is on the back of the door. Uh, make sure that there are no extension cords. And, I've seen, uh, I've seen this uh, occur. When I say no extension cords attached to any type of space heater, uh, and space heaters, if they are being used, they should be UL listed and nothing should be, uh, be around that, that space heat heater for about three feet at minimum. Uh, what I have seen are when you have those extension cords, if they're frayed, uh, that extension cord, if it's, if it's run under furniture, under a rug, when it actually goes on fire, the entire extension cord goes on fire. So uh, extension cords can be deadly. 
Uh, just make sure when you're in there that you're you're checking to, to make sure that there are no issues with any of the extension cords that might be uh, be being used. And then the entrance and and those those uh, those fireproof fireproof doors on the stairs on the apartments, making sure that they're functioning. Uh, and, and again, that's something that each public housing authority, you should make sure that your, your maintenance people are trained to, uh, to, to go in there and see the signs of, of those little, little areas that you can mitigate to, to make it safer. Thank you, Ted. Um, now we are going to shift um, to, well, those were also preparing and being uh, ready to respond to a fire, um, we will now be talking additional items um, to prepare uh, and be ready in advance of a fire. I'm gonna turn it over to Barb to talk to us about insurance. Uh, Barb, you may be muted. Okay, I'm gonna, I will go ahead and talk about um, in, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and, and, and begin talking about insurance. It looks like she might be having some struggle with her microphone, but um, so insurance, especially in a fire, is always going to be the, the primary um, way to respond um, or financially respond and recover from a fire. Um, you want to be sure to be reviewing your insurance policy regularly so that you know that you have um, enough to cover all of the costs for um, recovering and replacing damages during um, following a fire. So a few things to note is um, work with your insurance representative. Make sure that they are explaining coverages to you. If you don't understand, make sure that you ask. Some things can be tricky. Um, exclusions and sublimits um, can be tricky. So be sure that you really do understand what is covered, what needs to be covered. Uh, know the claim reporting requirements in your policy. Um, sometimes there are timelines that you must report um, a fire or a, a, any claim. Um, and if you don't meet those, they can deny just based on the fact that you didn't report. So we will be talking about it more about making sure that one of the very first things that you do is contacting your insurance agent. Um, but certainly within 24 hours or within a couple of days, there might be you know, a, a reason for denying a claim if you didn't do it within the reporting requirements. Knowing the various deductibles um, and making sure to review those every single year. Um, verify that, that your property schedule is up to date. Um, make sure that all new properties that, you've recent, that have been recently acquired by the Housing Authority are listed. And very importantly, ensure that real estate values are current so that, um, that the when, when the fire, if a fire happens, um, that it's fully covered and brings up to current real estate values. So some additional things, when you're reading the details of your policy, we already did mention exclusions a little bit, any other restrictions, make sure that you know, and review the coverage amount to make sure that the property is not underinsured. And another thing is read every notice thoroughly that your insurance provider sends to you. So they are uh, required to send you policy changes in writing, um, but you might receive a letter, think it's a standardized thing, not read through it in detail, and then be surprised by a policy change that could substantially impact your coverage amount. So be sure that, um, that you are reading the, the notices that your insurance provider is sending out. I will turn it over at this point uh, to Fred, who is gonna talk about insurance requirements. Thank you, Jody. Uh, as Jody mentioned, 
insurance in any disaster and um, a building fire is no different is uh, PHA's first line of defense uh, and financial resource for recovery from uh, that disaster. Consequently, HUD has some requirements in place that uh, you as a PHA would uh, need to keep in mind. Um, the uh, annual contribution con uh, contract that uh, PHAs have uh, on your public housing developments uh, require um, specifically that there be uh, adequate, uh, one, up-to-date insurance policies, and two, that they adequately cover the uh, development uh, at replacement costs. So um, you must uh, ensure that your policies actually cover a, a current replacement costs uh, should you have a, a total loss. Um, those regulations can be found in a link here um, and, uh, in uh, 24 CFR uh, 965 and in under HUD's PHA insurance requirements. Um, uh, there's a FAQ also that uh, is linked here that uh, you'll be able to uh, uh, you'll be able to access later after the training. I want to talk to you a little bit about readiness for uh, building fires and, and really uh, any disaster. Uh, you, how a PHA responds to recovers from uh, and recovers from a, a building fire is impacted by how pre well prepared you are prior to the fire. And there's some things that you can do to prepare. Uh, one is you want to assess. Uh, what your actual and potential risk uh, and needs are. Uh, you want to develop partnerships uh, locally with others who may be able to help you and your residents out. You want to organize uh, all of the resources that you have as a PHA and um, make sure that your systems are uh, prepared to support you in case of a building fire. And then you want to undertake, uh, begin planning for um, both uh, readiness and recovery, uh, and then uh, conduct training and education and uh, run uh, drills and exercises uh, with uh, your residents and staff. A few things to keep in mind about uh, building fire risk assessments. One, you want to try to identify where there are particular threats uh, and hazards, and Ted talked a little bit about what those types of threats and hazards are um, and come up with uh, scenarios for how you would respond to those. You wanna know what your vulnerabilities are from uh, based on your portfolio, look at your actual portfolio and make a determination. And Ted again talked about some of the ways that you can uh, do that. You, uh, uh, by partnering with your local fire department and conducting those risk assessments on a periodic basis, it will help you um, to come up with list of um, things that you can address. Uh, you can also, and most importantly, provide your PHA, uh, your, your uh, fire departments with uh, a list of those residents that you have who are most vulnerable, those who have mo mobility issues, those uh, who uh, have any type of uh, other disabilities, and uh, certainly those who are using oxygen devices. Uh, you want to inspect your units and common areas to identify where there's, where there's risk and where uh, you may have noncompliance with uh, the inspection standards and fire codes as, as Ted talked to, to you about. And then finally, uh, maintain your property uh, to reduce those fire hazards by clearing away debris from roofs, gutters, um, and uh, aligning uh, 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 around from within five feet of the building. Um, HUD has a number of best practices uh, that you can use in conducting a physical needs assessment. Um, and uh, it is recommended that you do this at least once every five years. 
um, as a part of your strategic planning process. And so uh, here we link to a tool that you can use in performing your physical needs assessment. In terms of resources, uh, well, your primary resource, of course, is your people, your, your staff. You want to make sure that uh, in getting ready for a potential fire, that they are trained, that they know what they're supposed to do and how they're supposed to communicate uh, one to another during a uh, fire. Uh, in terms of your facilities, you want to uh, identify what all the, as Ted mentioned before, the guidelines are for evacuation um, and knowing uh, where it is that uh, uh, people who are, again, just uh, where you're going to put those people who are displaced, um, who have a housing need, should you uh, have damage to, to any of the units. Uh, in terms of systems, you want to develop policies for uh, working conditions and communication strategies with both your staff and your residents, uh, should you have a fire. Uh, your equipment, you want to make sure that there, of course, are adequate supplies like fire extinguishers and first aid supplies on, on, um, on site uh, and accessible to uh, your staff and residents. And then uh, finally, we talked a bit about the insurance policies, making sure, though, that you have uh, printed copies of those or um, that there are electronic copy, copies that are backed up someplace that you can access and should you have damage to your, uh, your headquarters operating facilities. Uh, in terms of staff, uh, a fire can um, impact uh, your, your staff as, as well as your residents. And so you want to make sure that there is a uh, continuation, uh, a continuity of, oper uh, of operations plan that's in place uh, and people understand what the policies are and what their tasks are. Um, know what their chain of authority is, who's going to be responsible for what. Uh, sometimes in, in disasters, fires included, uh, it uh, may not be the executive director, it may be someone else who is a safety officer and then is responsible for um, decision making um, at that time. Those, whoever uh, is responsible, what those roles are, um, needs to be identified uh, in your in your coup plan. And then uh, uh, partnerships, we're going to talk a little bit more about this going forward, but uh, your partnerships um, that you develop, you need to define the roles and responsibilities and how you're going to coordinate with any partners that you have uh, in, in responding to a disaster. Uh, building fires in, in particular. Uh, some fire safety uh, procedures to keep in mind. I want to clearly identify uh, the building evacuation routes and plans uh, in residential buildings and in your administrative facilities. Ted talked a bit about this. Um, and so um, you'll hear uh, more about this uh, from Cheryl in our case study. Uh, in include fire safety and evacuation information at the time of lease renewals, talk to folks about uh, fire safety and other uh, uh, disasters and how your, uh, your PHA will respond and what the residents' responsibilities are at the time of uh, lease renewals. And you want to maintain uh, a list of the residents um, who, um, uh, so that when you are evacuating or need to evacuate or if a fire happens, you will be able to account for everyone. Uh, get a current email address, phone number, um, it, know if they can receive text and emails and uh, by all means have an emergency contact person, someone who you can call um, as a backup. Uh, again, update that information at the time you do your lease renewals. Uh, know uh, those people who have any type of mobility challenges uh, uh, during evacuation and share this information with the first responders on, on a regular basis. Update that list and, and share it with the first responders. Know who is on oxygen. Uh, this is vitally important uh, should there be a fire and share that information with your first responders as well. 
just a, a bit about partnership. I, I mentioned it uh, earlier, but uh, no, no one can do this alone, right? And there are partners in uh, the community to, to work with you if there should be a building fire uh, at, at your PHA. Uh, you want to establish those partnerships uh, and define the roles well in advance. So know who on the municipal level, who at your parish or county level um, you should be working with and coordinating with. Know, uh, again, who the, the responsible parties are uh, for those re coordination relationships uh, at uh, your PHA. Uh, and, and again, your residents have a, uh, a, a responsibility and uh, have things that they should be doing should there be uh, a fire, but also to, to mitigate and, and prevent uh, fires at your developments. And then, uh, of course, HUD, uh, your local HUD office is always there as a partner should um, you, to help you prepare for and, and uh, respond to, but uh, should you have an event to, to also recover from. Uh, I'll uh, turn it over to Ted to talk about uh, a multidisciplinary community approach. Thank you, Fred. And, and you touched on it. I cannot emphasize uh, enough to, to the PHAs uh, to make sure that you liaison with your, your municipal services. And uh, something that I've always, uh, I've always actually lived by uh, in my career, whether it was uh, in the FDNY or as the director of public safety up in Stanford, is to make sure that that we had relationships with uh, public housing, with uh, with businesses, uh, with community organizations, because it's so important uh, as we we talk about preparing, uh, being ready. Uh, responding to events or, or recovering from events. And uh, the first time an event uh, occurs should not be the first contact that you have with any one of these public safety, uh, sa public safety departments. Uh, but we are talking about building fires. So uh, having a, a relationship and liaisoning with the, the fire department uh, and EMS is so important. Uh, and the reason why is you want to uh, make sure that you are prepared in terms of, of readiness for anything that, that may occur. You want them to come to the location. And uh, one, of the, one, of, one of the individuals on this call I worked with uh, in New York City Public Housing, an excellent, uh, an excellent working relationship. And again, I cannot emphasize our PHA up in Stanford. What a great, great relationship we've had with them, very proactive. So don't be afraid to, uh, to utilize your, your municipal services. Uh, and liaison with them uh, because they can definitely help you. And I say this all the time, we're all in this together. Our, our, our jobs, uh, whether you're working with a municipality, uh, whether you're a PHA, uh, public safety, is to really reduce risk for the safety of the, the residents within the, uh, the, the community. So forming those relationships is, is utterly important. And that, that far in EMS, we, we did mention about inspections, uh, you can get your local uh, local inspection checklist uh, because remember each locality is different. There is a building code, there is a fire code, but there's also local ordinances that must be followed. So try to form that that relationship even before a, an emergency would uh, would occur. Emergency management. A lot of time, uh, a lot of times, emergency management directors are from the fire department. Many times, they're the fire chief. Uh, some municipalities have independent uh, emergency management directors, but emergency management is going to help you through uh, throughout that that emergency. They're there to provide support. Uh, they'll help you with any ideas that you may have in terms of emergency notification systems, uh, in terms of your your plans, uh, as well as the emergency and recovery uh, assisting. And it's important it's important to be prepared to respond but it's not over. Uh, you're preparing, you're responding, and then you're recovering. And that's, that's where you're going to, uh, to need a, a lot of assistance. And uh, they'll be the liaison with, uh, with your uh, state organizations, with other public safety departments. So utilize that, that emergency management function as much as possible. 911 communications, you did hear Fred mention about making sure uh, that if you have anybody with disabilities or any, any needs in terms of oxygen, make sure that the public safety departments are aware of those individuals. Right? This way they can formulate a plan to make sure that when they come to the scene, 
they can provide uh, safety and security to that individual by removing them from the, the location as safe as, as possible. Uh, non way communications in a lot of municipalities, there's, there's what's called text 911. Uh, it's important to, to make sure that 911 communications uh, receives the, the, the emergency right away so that they can send out the first responders to get to the location. But a lot of 911 communication centers also have what's called critical information dispatch. So you can provide the fire chief, uh, the director of 911 communications, with information related to individuals with functional needs, with disability, uh, disabilities, with any type of access issues into the apartment or to the building, or any other type of functional needs. So updating that critical information, and when I say it's critical information, it would be the, the burden of the public housing authority to make sure that those those lists that are provided to the Nyman Communication Center or to the fire chief or, or to emergency management are updated on a frequent basis because everybody on this webinar knows people do come in and they do, uh, do leave. Uh, so we wanna make sure that we have the most updated information so that the first responders can respond appropriately. Also, police come not only to fires, uh, a lot of times police will assist in a, uh, an investigation uh, with the fire marshal's office but they're there to, uh, to address any, any crime issues or any type of quality of life issues. And again, through my career, I've had excellent uh, relationships with our public housing authority, uh, and we've worked to, uh, to resolve some of the, the crime and the quality of life issues. The health department, something that, that a lot of PHAs probably aren't, uh, aren't really in tune or, or focused with, but I can tell you through COVID, our, our relationships with the PHAs was exceptional. Uh, there's no doubt that we reduce risk and there's no doubt that, that many lives were saved based on the proactivity that we, uh, we, we utilized through, uh, through COVID. But a lot of health departments, they're also there to address environmental issues. Uh, they're there to uh, address housing codes and other health issues. So uh, having a liaison with the health department is also, uh, also beneficial. Now, social services, uh, a, lot of, a lot of times in municipalities, uh, it's called also mandated services, but social services can help with, uh, in terms of relocation, working with the Red Cross, setting up shelters with emergency management, and making sure that there's as, as much of a seamless transition uh, from that, that response uh, to that disaster to recovery. So working with the social services or the mandated services the department is extremely important. And I'm gonna emphasize again, we're all in this together. Together, Please make sure that you, you liaison with each of your public safety departments. Uh, it's gonna be beneficial and you're gonna see a payoff in di dividends in the, uh, in the future. Now, training and exercises uh, in the fire service and all the public safety, we train and we exercise all the time because we don't want uh, our first encounter uh, coming to an emergency scene uh, to, to be uh, unprepared and, and not ready to, uh, to respond. And there's a lot of protocols and we talk about having fire safety plans, but also for, for building management, you should have your plans in place. If you have your plans in place, that's the time to train and exercise and I can, can honestly say throughout my career, when I was at the fire department, we would go to the public housing authorities, we would train with them, we would exercise, uh, and the same thing with, uh, with where I was previously as the director. Uh, I recommend that you try to bring in your local emergency management, fire and police departments, uh, and it'll be beneficial not only to, to you, to your staff, to residents, but also to, to those public safety departments. Communicating staff roles is so, uh, so important. Uh, each, each staff member should know how to, uh, to respond and that's why training and exercising uh, is so important. And I think everybody heard me mention this before. Uh, when I, going back many years, when a resident told me, I know exactly what to do. This is not my, my first fire. Uh, so we wanna make sure that your, uh, your staff and the residents are, are really prepared for, for what may occur. And if you're prepared, it's easy to, uh, to, to make sure that you respond and that you respond uh, appropriately. Practice response exercise so that the staff understand the challenges of their roles during a fire. Uh, notification to 911 communication is key, but even management has to make sure uh, your management staff or your building staff that they are operating from a safe location because if they become part of the problem, they can make it worse. 
rather than uh, making it better. So training and exercise and will embed that into, uh, into to, to that mindset. And then training the residents on emergency response procedures. I don't know if everybody's aware, but in October, usually the first week is fire prevention week and it's coming up uh, October 9th this year. That's the perfect time to train residents on emergency response procedures. Perfect time to, uh, to review those fire safety plans that you should have uh, and really answer any questions that they may have. It's good for the residents. Uh, it's good for, for the building management. It's good for everybody at the location. So uh, I do recommend that during uh, fire prevention week, uh, you do, do train try to send out uh, a lot of uh, a lot of updates to to residents and you can go on to uh, to the different sites whether it's ready.gov nfpa and they'll provide you with more information that you can provide to uh, to residents and then again engage the residents and the community members and a lot of times fire departments will come to the scene if you ask them to come to the scene during fire fire prevention week they can bring a lot of informational uh, materials and sometimes they they do some show and tell where they may utilize a, a fire extinguisher and show how to, uh, to extinguish a fire. And extinguishing a fire is a complicated situation because I don't recommend that people use a fire extinguisher on a fire that's spreading, but making sure if it's contained uh, and it's not spreading, if you use that fire extinguisher, you can, uh, can, can really extinguish that fire and uh, make it safe for everyone. But uh, Having everybody prepared to, to make sure that they know how to, uh, to evacuate the building, to make sure that they close the door, the, the room uh, door where the fire might be occur occurring, uh, the apartment door, and making sure that those stairwell doors are, are closed while notifying everybody. It's something that should, should be emphasized. And then those policies and procedures, each public housing authority should review in their, their own policies, uh, have them updated. And we've had safety groups where you can, again, going back to that multidisciplinary approach, you can actually have each of those departments ask them if they would uh, review it and see if they could provide some, uh, some, some positive tips to improve. And again, the goal is to reduce risk as, as much as possible. And then it's important to maintain a regular schedule to, to have your staff check the equipment, check the supplies, do a walkthrough throughout the building. Uh, it's so important, again, to, uh, to, to be prepared. Next slide. Now we're gonna transition from a disaster readiness to a disaster response. Uh, again, it's all part of that preparing for, responding to, recovering and, and performing the mitigation. Now, immediate building fire response, it's important that, that individuals train and exercise as we spoke about before. Calling 911 immediately from a safe area as soon as the individual is aware of a fire no matter how small is so important. In my career, I've been around where there was a delayed response because individuals did not notify 911 immediately. Going back to fires, remember fires are gonna grow very, very quickly. So it's important to call 911 and 911 communication is really the, the heart of public safety. Uh, if 911 communication is not notified, that means that our first responders are not going to uh, to be responding to the uh, to the scene. So, making sure that your staff and that the residents are are aware to call nine one one, that is the uh, the number one priority. But again, it has to be from a safe area, and when they call, they should provide as much information as possible in terms of the location of the fire. You know, are there any trapped residents, uh, and what's burning? Uh, but please remember, you have to make that call from a safe area. Don't, don't become part of the, uh, the problem. You want to make sure that residents properly follow plan procedures to either shelter in place or evacuate the building to a secure location. Uh, so this is uh, the way they can be safe and out of the uh, first, first responders way. Many times people will gather in the lobby. That's probably the worst location for them to be because they, they will be impeding the fire response that will, uh, will be occurring. And remember, having, having that immediate building fire response and training and exercise, a lot of the PHAs that are on this webinar are not from those, those larger cities. And uh, a lot of times they will have volunteer fire departments or combination uh, fire departments on scene. A lot of times they're going to have to provide as much assistance to the residents as, as possible. So that's why making sure that, that the, the first fire that 
an employee uh, may react to uh, is, is not the first day on the job. They should also be, uh, be trained. Surveying to account for the location of residents and staff are in the building. It's so important to, to make sure that the people are safe uh, that you can provide that information to, uh, to, to the first responders when they come on scene. Uh, from I've been fortunate enough to be in a situation where I was able to, to pull people out of fires uh, within buildings. And I attribute that to the information that I received on the scene. It's important to make sure that you have a liaison, liaison on the scene who can provide as much information as to what's happening in, in that fire in terms of people trapped, in terms of where the fire protection systems are, uh, any, any issues that might be occurring, any, any renovations that might be going on. Uh, providing that information to the incident commander is so important and to those first responders. Uh, that information and timely information can definitely save a, uh, save a life. You wanna make sure that you connect with that, uh, connect with that incident commander uh, for initial guidance. Uh, they will tell you what, what is needed. Uh, they may ask you to stand fast, uh, remain at the scene so that you can provide as much information to them as possible. And then sometimes, depending upon the, uh, the, uh, the fire marshal's office, they may request a fire watch. Uh, fire watch crew may be needed uh, for at least 24 hours uh, to make sure that the, uh, the scene is safe uh, and to, to make sure that it does not reignite. So working with the fire marshal, working with the incident commander is, is very important at these, uh, these scenes. And again, you don't wanna be in the way, but you wanna identify yourself so that this way, if they have any questions, uh, they will definitely ask for, uh, for any information that is pertinent to, uh, to, to that fire scene. You wanna wait for the fire marshal approval before re-entering the property. I've been at fires where you had maintenance individuals who automatically went back into to the building uh, based on uh, the maintenance protocols that they've done in the past. You wanna make sure that that fire marshal gives approval because a building that, that has been exposed to fire is really considered a, a building that, that is really under renovation and uh, degradation. So do not enter the building unless you have that uh, approval from the fire marshal uh, for safety reasons, but also uh, if, if you go into the building, you can actually impede the investigation. And then in coordination with the fire department, you want to, uh, to make sure that uh, you follow the incident commander's di directions on securing the property uh, by locking the doors, the windows of damaged units. Uh, and you wanna make sure any utilities that have been shut off by the fire department, they maintain off. Uh, management should not be coming in and turning on any utilities uh, because you may have a degraded gas line. You may have some, something else that you might not be aware of, you want to make sure that before any utilities are turned on, that you have a licensed professional come to the location and actually uh, make sure that it's safe to, uh, to, to, to turn it back on. Next slide. Now, we mentioned about working with the fire marshal, uh, fire scene investigations. Fire scene investigations can, can be quick. They can go on for a long time. Uh, so you want to, to make sure that you liaison with the fire marshal on scene. After a fire, the investigation will be conducted. It's important to preserve the scene for the investigation. And that's why you should get the uh, approval of the fire marshal before entering the building, uh, just to make sure that you're not going to, uh, to impede with the investigation. And you may think, well, you know, I'm going to the, to the basement to, to check on something that, that may be important to you. But if you go down there and a system or a valve is shut off or a, a, a sprinkler system and you, you actually play with that or you, you restore it to, to the location it was before, that could definitely impede the investigation. So uh, during a fire, please make sure that you get approval from the fire marshal and incident commander uh, before you do anything on the scene once they're there. Follow the directions of the fire department, incident commander, and the fire marshal. Uh, it again, can't emphasize how important that is. Uh, I don't wanna be the dead horse, but make sure that you listen and follow their directions. And then the investigator may additionally restrict access to parts of the property until the investigation is complete. Again, that could be for a minor duration of several hours. It can be for 24 hours. We've maintained uh, custody of a building for, for weeks. So it's something that you want to, uh, to, to work with them. Again, liaison with them. Uh, so that this way you know what's going on and how it's going to uh, proceed. 
But during that fire scene investigation, they're going to ask you for records of inspections, any type of maintenance records, uh, any type of uh, drill or exercise records. Uh, they want to know what's going on, uh, any type of construction or renovations within the building. So make sure that you, you have good records of, of your buildings. And then liaison with that fire department until the investigation, investigation is complete. And again, uh, the liaison could be the fire marshal's best friend in making sure that that fire marshal does a, a good investigation, determines the cause, and then hopefully we can prevent anything, uh, any, any building fires from happening again in that complex uh, and even expand that to, uh, to, to the, the larger, uh, get that information out to all public housing authorities. Thank you, um, Ted, for all of that. Um, next, we are going to, uh, Barbara is going to talk with you about insurance again. Okay, thank you, Ted. That was very useful information. Um, now the fires occurred, a big one, and this is when you start really thinking about your insurance and examining, examining your insurance policy. The first thing you're going to do is contact your insurance provider after addressing life safety issues, making sure that everybody's okay. Um, then it's really important to make sure that you have adequate in insurance coverage to promptly repair and restore your public housing building. That's outlined in the annual contributions contract. Confirm that your policy is written with a blanket limit, including loss of rents coverage, extra expense, and full replacement costs. And I can't reinforce enough or state enough the importance of having a blanket li limit policy when there's a catastrophic loss or a major fire. It's best to have updated insurance policies printed and readily available for the in-house insurance representatives, but it's really great to have an electronic copy available for all the others um, within your organization that need access to the policy. Um, for multiple locations, it would be too cumbersome and a waste of paper to have printed copies for everyone, but those insurance representatives need that and they need to know what the limits are, the deductibles are. The insurance company will send out someone to inspect the building. It often takes 24 to 48 hours after a fire is reported to an insurance carrier for an adjuster to actually show up. And they can't show up until the fire department has turned the unit or the building back over to the housing authority. But um, once they're there, it's really important that they take pictures, they take notes, they write a full on inspection. It's also beneficial for that housing authority to have that inspection and some pictures of the um, property before the fire so that you can compare notes. Thank you, Barb. Um, uh, and now a few things to keep in mind in terms of building fire response. Uh, when a fire happens, uh, the first thing you want to do is assess uh, the impact to uh, your residents and your staff. Uh, identify if there have been an impact on it has been an impact on your building operations, and then uh, how has your housing stock been? affected and what the immediate needs are that are arising from the fire. Uh, based upon your assessment, you want to uh, prioritize your resources uh, uh, accordingly, uh, assign staff uh, and <clears throat> uh, identify other resources that are, are needed to respond to the, the impacts of the building fire. Uh, you want to reach out to all the community partners. We talked about the importance of developing uh, partnerships in advance. Uh, there are community partners that will help you with any displaced residents, help with immediate food and shelter needs that you may have um, as a PHA following a fire. And then, of course, notify your HUD office um, of uh, the fact that there has been a, a fire. Um, and keep them updated. Uh, and then uh, and in particular, you want to let them know about any impacts to uh, residents and damage to the property. Uh, you can communicate with your, your local HUD office about uh, potential waivers that may be available to you um, as a PHA because of the impacts of the fires. 
and also if there is going to be a need uh, for uh, tenant protection vouchers for uh, residents that are going to be uh, displaced for a long period of time. Uh, you want to communicate with your residents. Uh, let them know uh, regularly what uh, the conditions are at the, the property and what the expectations are, more importantly, uh, for them as residents because of the impact of, of any fire. Some things to think about in terms of rehousing, uh, should there be a fire and people are displaced. Um, we mentioned the importance of having uh, community partners. One community partner that regularly steps in uh, after fires is the, the Red Cross. Uh, they uh, can help sometimes with uh, sheltering. Also, there are uh, civic and church groups that often step up and provide meals and other types of services that uh, necessary, and you'll hear more about this um, in an actual example when uh, Cheryl speaks uh, shortly. Uh, know that your hotel cost may be covered under your PHA's insurance policy. Uh, already, Barb talked to you about the importance of having adequate insurance and making sure that uh, things like um, uh, like uh, those costs uh, are covered in your insurance policy. But know that uh, some of your residents uh, may have, and you should encourage them, of course, to get renters insurance uh, that may cover the cost of uh, any damage that they have to their personal property. And then uh, hotel costs can be covered by uh, HUD's uh, emergency capital fund. There is a set aside uh, in the cap fund each year for disasters. Uh, this funding is available typically on a first come first serve basis. Uh, it's limited. Uh, Congress uh, only provides a certain amount to HUD each year. And so uh, if there is a need at your PHA from a fire or other disaster, please get in contact with your local field office. They can help you with identifying if that, those funds are available and uh, how you can access those. Uh, uh, again, communicate uh, locally um, with other partners who may be able to help you with things like transportation uh, and getting your residents to someplace safe and away from uh, the fire. Uh, there are transportation companies that you can actually uh, have an agreement with in advance to move your residents to some place uh, where you may shelter them or some alternate um, housing um, solutions that are available. Know that uh, for public housing residents uh, who need to relocate that there, uh, if there is substantial enough damage to their unit, you may be eligible for tenant protection uh, vouchers. You, of course, have to uh, have an approval um, by the Special Application Center uh, for uh, demolition and disposition of any of those units. Um, there's a link here uh, below that will help you to um, identify the requirements for um, any type of demolition or disposition of damaged units. Thanks, Fred. Um, now we're gonna hear about um, a, an actual event. Um, Ogdensburg, New York on March 8th of this year. Ogdensburg is a city with a population of about 11,000 located in St. Lawrence County at the Northern border of New York State. And the Ogdensburg Housing Authority has almost 400 public housing units in four developments and a staff of 11, which includes six maintenance staff and five office staff. That also includes their executive director. Um, so the event Riverview Towers is an 11 story public housing building that's occupied mostly by elderly residents. On the day of the fire, 89 of the units were occupied and 104 residents were displaced. Although there were some injuries, all of the residents were safely evacuated from the building. We have Executive Director Cheryl Douglas with us today to tell us about the day of the fire, how the Housing Authority was prepared to respond, and what the response was like both during and after the fire. Cheryl, thank you for being with us today and sharing this experience. 
Jody, you're welcome and thank you for asking. <clears throat> so as far as readiness goes, um, I don't think anybody's ever really ready, <laughs> but we did the best we could. Um, one of the first things I had um, done as the executive director, I introduced myself to the um, some of the primary players and the um, local city staff, um, city manager, the fire chief, and the police chief. And one of the things that I also did was make sure that I kept up with that because we've been through two city managers, two fire chiefs, and three police chiefs since I've been here. So I made sure that they all knew who I was and what we were all about. Um, as Ted had mentioned, there are buildings that are built to be considered fireproof. Um, fortunately, all three of our high rises are built that way. Um, <clears throat> they're built to withstand fire and to contain it in the unit for a long period of time through the concrete and plaster construction, uh, the self-closing fire doors on the units, as well as the sprinkler systems in the hallways outside of the unit, which will at least keep the fire contained to that unit. Um, we have hardwired and battery smoke detectors in each unit. We also have fire doors in the hallways and we have self-closing doors on our stairwells, which also should contain the smoke, which is also definitely a deadly part of the fire. Um, we maintain all of our inspections on an annual basis as, as we're required by law and regulation. Um, our fire pump, sprinkler system, fire panel, fire extinguishers, the fight in the fire doors in the hallways are inspected as, as needed. Um, my maintenance staff also walk the floors quite a bit and um, they, you know, they note if any of the doors aren't closing properly and whatnot that we make sure that we take care of that. As far as the tenants go, we discuss fire safety at lease up. Um, we go through basic fire procedures. We also have a monthly newsletter um, and we put fire safety in there periodically, usually um, at least twice a year, if not more often. Basically we tell them because of the construction of the unit, of our units in the high rises, um, if fire is in your unit, you leave immediately, you close your door, you go to a neighbor for safety and you call 911. And if you're able, activate the pull station in the hallway before you get into that tenant, the neighbor's apartment. We also tell them if the fire is in, a, in, the, in another unit, shelter in place, that they should stay in the unit until emergency responder comes to get them or they hear the all clear over our PA system. I know it's counterintuitive and it's a really hard conversation to have with the tenants because everybody's um, instinct is to get out. But when you're dealing with a lot of elderly and disabled tenants who are now going to have to use stairs because the elevators are not operational during a fire emergency, except for emergency responders, using the stairwell creates all kinds of problems in and of itself. Um, we also tell them that if they find that smoke is entering their apartment while they are sheltering in place, use a rolled wet towel along the door go to the window for air if they need it and use a wet washcloth over their nose and mouth if they find that to be necessary. Um, at recertification time, we ask all of our tenants to update their emergency contacts, their phone number and their email for any type of notification and tracking during and after an event. One of the things we also do is when we're asking for emergency contacts, we ask them to provide at least two because I can't tell you how many times we call one and they're not available, we're able to have that secondary contact. Um, one of the other things that we do on an annual basis is when our insurance is up for renewal, um, we go through it with our agent, we discuss the schedule of values and any changes in coverage that have occurred during the year. We do, kind, we do keep track of all the paperwork that comes in during the year because I will tell you in this situation, if something changes in your coverage, it has to be communicated to you in writing or the prior coverage will prevail. And we had that happen with one of the um, items in our insurance coverage and they are going to have to cover it as it was in the prior policy because we did not get the proper notification. 
that was that was something that was very interesting that came out of this whole thing, among other things. Um, as far as the response to the fire, um, I arrived on the scene just after the fire department had arrived and my maintenance man assigned to the building told us that we had an active fire on the sixth floor. I immediately called all maintenance in from the other locations and then I called the office. I needed to get some people in to help. Um, I got two office staff there and basically I told them bring 30 copies of the uh, tenant list so that we had enough and we Anybody that needed one had one. Um, we provided copies of the list to the incident command and then any of the other, other people on site who did need them. Um, we started getting tenants who had self-evacuated because we did have a few um, out of the lobby area and around the, entry, around the entry to the building so that fire personnel could get in and out of the building unimpeded. Um, we have a sister property on the same city block. So they had to go across the parking lot. We um, evacuated them to the community room next door. Um, I had one of my staff go to the community room so that we could start taking count of who was there. And as family became, began showing up, um, my other staff member was there um, trying to track who was being taken by family or friends from the scene because we did have quite a few people leaving during the active fire. Um, we worked with the emergency response command doing whatever they needed us to do during the fire. Um, uh, the initial response to the fire was our local department, which had four firefighters on duty at the time. Three had gone into the building to attack the fire, but they found the tenant from the fire unit in the hallway who needed medical assistance. So they had to retreat and bring him back down. That short delay, unfortunately, allowed the fire a good start. So when the other departments began, began arriving, um, they ended up attacking the fire from outside the building with the um, ho exterior hose attached to the ladder truck. And while that put the fire out quickly, it dumped quite a bit of water into the building as in thousands of gallons of water into the building. Um, in total, we had eight departments who responded to the scene. We are fairly rural up here, so that's not unusual. Um, all of the departments responding helped with evacuation, including taking some of the residents from the sixth floor, which was the, the worst hit, um, out by bucket and area ladder. Our county emergency services coordinator, um, as well as another man trained in emergency response was on scene. In behind the scenes and in conjunction with information that I was giving them, um, worked to mobilize the Red Cross and get transportation set up and a shelter opened because we knew at this point that we were not going to be able to reoccupy the building that day at least. Um, the high school sent buses. And we went to their gymnasium where the Red Cross had set up, um, had begun setting up a shelter for us. There were other community service organizations there as well. Um, the school fed us dinner and they provided staff to assist. Um, and they also provided some necessities that they knew that my tenants were going to need out of the pantry that they keep at the school, which were toothpaste, toothbrushes, that type of thing. Um, unbeknownst to me, there were two um, fire department chaplains on scene who realized we were going to need, um, definitely need a shelter. So they had contacted the bishop of our local Catholic diocese and um, he made a, a former seminary, which is just outside of town. It's called Wadhams Hall, um, which is now being used as an event center. He made it available to us as an emergency shelter, which was perfect. Um, it had the student rooms. They had already had them set up as beds with bed, as bedrooms because they had, it's an event center, um, had classrooms that we used as Offices had as the library where a lot of the tenants were able to gather. It had kitchen facilities. 
So the, the buses took the tenants to um, the Catholic thrift store on their way up to get any immediately any immediate clothing needs that they had because a lot of these people, some had no shoes, some had left in their pajamas. Um, they, they got what they could get from the thrift store before heading on up to Wadhams Hall. Um, the Wadhams Hall staff, along with the Red Cross, multiple county department heads, my tenant relations person, um, and that gentleman that I noted before, um, ran the shelter for two weeks um, that we were there. Um, most of the tenants did not have renter's insurance, so they had no other place to go if they couldn't go with friends or family. Um, a lot of people did go with friends and family, so the, the numbers fluctuated as tenants came and went. Um, at the peak, we had 48 people in the um, emergency shelter with us. Um, the St. Lawrence County Office for the Aging meal site director was on scene to run the kitchen facilities for us. Um, the Meal on Wheels program provided meals as well as local restaurants and local businesses who sponsored meals through the restaurants, all donated. Um, volunteers from the community were on site to provide entertainment. We had bingo, we had karaoke. Um, they sorted donated clothing and necessities and even a beautician came in for haircuts. Um, with ongoing communication with the tenants um, happened through daily tenant meetings for those who were on site, phone calls and Facebook page. Anyone who wasn't staying on the shel at the shelter was, uh, was welcome to come for the meals, clothing, necessities and to the meeting so that they knew what was going on. And we did have a lot of people coming and going. Um, Rehousing the tenants obviously turned to a priority after a couple of days when, you know, we, things had somewhat settled. Those who didn't go with friends and family were going to need a longer term um, housing situation. Um, Canton and Messina Housing immediately reached out. We were able to, we ourselves were able to provide housing to 17 families in our other developments that had empties at the time. Canton took on 18 families and Messina took on one family as we um, worked to get tenants rehomed. We worked with the tenants and the other authorities to make sure that they had any information that they needed to get them into the system and to get them leased up. Um, those with those few who did have renters insurance re either rented privately or had some or had hotels that they were able to go to. Um, being such a small area, we don't have a lot of um, hotel space that's empty, and we knew that this was going to be somewhat of a longer term. And with our seasons coming on in this area, a lot of the hotels that we initially contacted didn't was they weren't going to have the availability that we were going to need. Um, as a result of the fire, we couldn't let any anyone into the building. It was condemned the day of the fire. Um, so the tenants couldn't access their belongings. So those that we did rehome in um, other in either our facility or other facilities were um, given loaned um, beds, stands, dressers, kitchen table, and chairs from a local nursing home that had recently closed. Um, other local organizations had grant funds and provided dishes, pots, pans, and microwave, and the Red Cross provided the funding that they normally do in the event of a disaster. We also had a generous community that provided I think it was at least $100, if not $150 per person in gift cards to everyone affected. Um, so the day after the fire, I contacted our insurance carrier and we became that pro began that process. And then I also contacted HUD to let them know where we were with that so that we could begin any processes that we needed with HUD. So that's where we were up until recovery. Carol, thank you so much. Um, what an amazing community response. Um, so many people impacted. Um, I, I wanted to just mention, I know that we have been scheduled to go um, just for 90 minutes. Um, we still do have probably 10 to 15 minutes left of content. And I really do invite you to stay with us. Um, 
If you are not able to stay with us for the next 15 minutes or so, these slides are going to be posted. They're available. Um, the recording and the slides will be available on the HUD exchange. And so please do go and visit that because we are going to be talking about recovery resources, which is critical. Um, and we want to hear the end of, of Cheryl's story and hear how the residents are doing now. So um, again, I know that we had scheduled for 90 minutes, but we uh, we still have some content. So with that, we will begin talking about recovery. And I will turn it over to Fred Tombar. Thank you, Jody. So um, a fire happens. What do you want to do um, to recover? Well, one, uh, identify first what are the long-term housing needs for your residents uh, and begin to um, execute um, a plan to uh, return those residents to, to the damaged units. Um, how are you going to repair them? What, uh, uh, what are the, the specific needs that are there? Communicate, as we talked about before, regularly with the residents, uh, let them know what's going on with the recovery and how you can help them with any long-term uh, housing options that they need to uh, identify. Then uh, uh, the assessment, we talked about that earlier, but you wanna verify that um, everything works properly uh, and uh, especially all of your systems. Uh, the sprinkler systems, the elevators, all of the electronic um, the systems in, in your building. Work with your utility company and with your fire department um, uh, to uh, do these assessments and make sure that everything is in working order um, as appropriate. And then uh, conduct uh, the post uh, fire assessments of damages uh, really want to do um, a structural um, assessment, make sure that there has been no structural damage or what uh, understanding what type of structural damage happened to your, your property um, uh, after the event and what steps you need to take. And then uh, based upon that, make the plan for repairing, for rebuilding, for mitigating against future fires. Uh, after a disaster, fire, a building fire included, it may be that you need to immediately procure someone and do emergency procurements. Um, first of all, uh, know that your procurement um, requirements are uh, given, uh, are directed by your own um, administrative plan. Uh, uh, but uh, also there are HUD requirements that uh, you can look to at 2 CFR 200.320, uh, uh, which is linked here, that uh, provides information about uh, uh, the how to do an emergency procurement. Uh, and in your procurement handbook, also uh, linked here, you can provide, find some information about doing an emergency procurement if necessary. Know that if there is uh, a need for uh, substantial rehabilitation or rebuilding that an environmental review is going to be necessary. Uh, the regulations uh, governing the environmental review are found here linked here at 24 CFR. Uh, and so uh, we just refer you to those as we move on. Recovery funding. Uh, they, we talked a little bit earlier about some of the sources of funding. Uh, one certainly um, is the, the primary is always your insurance, right? Uh, we talked about the importance of adequacy of insurance, making sure that the insurance uh, is enough to cover the entire replacement cost of the building. Uh, but you also can use unobligated operating uh, fund reserve balances or uh, unobligated capital fund reserve uh, balances. Uh, oftentimes, as uh, Cheryl talked about, civic organizations will uh, help out um, in various ways around the recovery and response to um, a fire. Uh, and uh, in addition to you know, civic and church organizations, there may even be community foundations that would be available to help you out with some of the costs associated 
Uh, there is also a uh, HUD's Capital Fund Emergency um, and Natural Disaster Fund, which is a set aside uh, annually that Congress provides. Uh, this um, is available on a first come first uh, served base basis. It's limited uh, and there are requirements about how you go about accessing it that are linked here and you can work with the folks in your local field office for more information should you need or be interested in this uh, this type of funding. Uh, finally, uh, we talked a lot about partnerships and uh, specifically in disasters and fires included, there are a, a group of organizations called uh, Voluntary Agencies Active in Disasters. Uh, those um, are linked here at the National BOAD uh, website. They are uh, a valuable source, not just in terms of fires, uh, but also in any type of other disaster that uh, you may have. Um, also, uh, keep in mind that the Red Cross is a partner locally in, in every, um, in any fire incident as well. Uh, you know, as I mentioned before, church and civic organizations. Uh, so uh, rely on your partners to help you with uh, responding to uh, providing emergency food and sheltering helping with uh, other needs that your residents may have and also some resources for recovery and repair of, of any damaged buildings. Okay, fire-related water damage. Um, water is essential to extinguish a fire and sprinklers can save lives, but sometimes that water used to extinguish a fire can do as much damage as the fire, heat, and the smoke. Sometimes water damage is even greater cost to that PHA or greater damage than the damage from the fire itself. These types of damages can include destroying the building walls, flooring and the contents. Water can facilitate mold growth, which may cause additional damage. And it doesn't take long after um, that water hits the walls and the floors and the ceilings that mold can start to grow. Uh, water will disturb the building materials in, in older construction that may contain asbestos. Water can disturb the paint that may contain lead, and it can cause severe damage to elevators and other electrical systems. Please note that some sprinkler systems can continue to run for several minutes after a fire is extinguished. And in some jurisdictions, they need to be shut off by the fire department personnel or even the fire marshal. So know the requirements of your jurisdiction in advance because that excessive water can create extensive damage to your property. Lessons learned from insurance claims and, and coverage issues um, through the years of working for a large PHA and overseeing many claims. These are some of the big things that we've learned. Um, please encourage your residents at the time of signing the lease to purchase renter's insurance for their personal property. If it's lost in a major fire or flood, they're gonna look to the PHA first for reimbursement, but PHA insurance does not typically cover the personal property of others. Your commercial tenants that lease space from you need to provide certificates of insurance and list the public housing authority as additional insured for damages caused by fires or floods occurring during their tenancy. That way their insurance has to respond if there's a fire or flood in their unit rather than the PHA's insurance. Ensure that the insurance policy that the PHA has purchased is a blanket limit policy with replacement cost coverage and that your property schedules and valuations are up to date. Can't stress that importance of that enough. Provide documentation to the insurance carrier to justify extra expenses like hotel costs and um, travel expenses, things like that. Um, personal business, personal property. So that's the business uh, property of the PHA and loss of rents or debris removal. All of that needs to be submitted along with the damage claim for the building. Report the loss within 24 hours of the fire or flood. 
some insurance carriers may deny a claim if it's not reported within the timeline stated in the policy. And I have heard of claims getting reported after 10 days of an incident and being denied because they were not reported in a timely manner. And this last bullet is significantly important, and that is to hire professionals to examine the function of your elevators, sprinklers, and other major components of the building following a major fire. Thank, thank you, Barb. Mm -hmm. um, now we have an opportunity to hear about um, how the recovery is going. The Ogdensburg fire was at the beginning of March, um, and here we are in September. So it's been six months, um, and uh, I am excited to invite uh, Cheryl to talk about how the recovery has been going. Cheryl? Thank you. So as I noted, the day of the fire, um, our building was condemned. That's because the power and the water were turned off by the city. And um, we were told that nobody would be allowed in, back into the building, even contractors, until we had a plan for recovery, including all essential system certifications. Um, at the time, the fire chief was also the city manager. And as he did, his, after he did his initial inspection, he took kind of took me aside and he said, the scope of the renovation was going to be far beyond our ordinary maintenance and it'd be a terrible, it'd be terribly time intensive for someone who was also trying to actually run an authority. So he suggested that I contact an A&E firm to help guide us through the process. Um, that was incredible advice. Um, we had just vetted our A&E firms for our latest capital fund. So we knew what, <laughs> who they were, what they could do for us. So um, I called the day after the fire and um, Gaimo Architectural Engineering and Land Surveying agreed to help us on the recovery. Um, in working with them two days after the fire, we met with the city and we had a plan to um, move forward with getting the building back up to speed. So um, in doing that, I will say that um, Gaimo had facil was facilitating the hiring of the contractors as they had quite a few contacts within the industry. So they were able to get people in place that we were going to need to do this. Um, so within five days, the water, the electricity and the heat were back on with certifications. Um, the elevators, unfortunately, were not. They had been heavily damaged, and it was a little over a month before they were operational, which in and of itself was a feat because they had originally said it would be months if they had to replace everything in there. They, their engineers were able to come up with a plan to, um, to fix the elevators rather than replace all of the components. Um, one of the first things that we did, even before we got the power back on in the building, we got a water mitigation service in there to get the building dried out because as Barb said, water is not our friend in a high rise situation. The fire itself caused a complete loss in the unit, but the water impacted everything from the sixth floor down to the basement. Um, and it had extensive water damage in the walls and on the floors. Um, one of the things with having these fireproof buildings is they're kind of little cement boxes. So the water tended to run around the apartments and seep in to the floors in the apartment. It didn't cascade from the ceiling. So not a lot of the tenants belongings were impacted as much as you might think, but anything that was directly on the floor did get wet. And as, it, as the water followed the chases through the walls, um, the only place it really rained down it onto anything were the common areas on the first floor in the basement. It literally did look like we were having a rainstorm when they stopped putting water into the building. Um, so the basement through six had extensive water damage. Um, all the flooring had to be replaced on all of those floors, and especially floors two through six had an encapsulated asbestos tile, which required a remediation. Um, sixth floor had heavy smoke damage to the hallway and to some extent apartments, but not really as bad as you would expect. Um, our doors did, the fire doors as well as the apartment doors did keep a lot of the smoke at bay. Um, they set up air purifiers throughout the building as well to deal with the odor. 
Um, we did have to fix the elevators. We had to install new lighting and drop ceilings. We had to paint everything from six down, um, new sheetrock in the wall chases. We had to place, replace some kitchen and bathroom cabinetry that had gotten wet. And we were concerned that that could um, turn into a mold situation. So we, we did decide to replace that. Um, we've been lucky that we haven't had a lot of supply chain issues. We were able to pivot on a few things that were going to be an issue and we could um, just pick another color or pick another brand um, with the exception of countertops. We, we are getting close to the end of this process and countertops and cabinetry are turning into our problem. Um, as far as the insurance company goes, they sent a preliminary adjuster within a week. Um, he reported back that it was extensive, so they were able to provide us funds within a, some funds within a week. Um, the primary adjuster came in in about week three. Um, the insurance company also sent in their own engineering inspectors to survey the damage. Um, when we realized the extent of the damage and the differing opinions as to our engineers and the insurance company's engineers, um, we decided to explore hiring a public adjuster as we had been contacted by quite a few right after the fire. Um, I have a board member who's a retired judge, but he spent the first 20 years of his legal career in insurance. So he, um, he helped me with the process of vetting uh, the public adjusters and we ended up, ended up hiring the Nyland group probably the second best decision that we made. Um, he's been able to get us through the engineering reports to pinpoint the areas in our coverage that can be accessed. For instance, what's code related, business income loss, um, because there are all different little buckets as he calls them of different types of um, insurance coverages. And if you know what you're looking for, you can access them. Um, he was able to get our funds released in a timely manner so that we could cover our contractors. Nobody had to wait. Um, we also anticipate being covered in full, and we really do attribute that to having him work as closely as he did with the, uh, with the engineering group. So as of July 11th, we were able to open floors 7 through 11. They had the least amount of damage. and. Um, tenants were able to come back. We're opening the second floor next Monday. Tenants on the second will be able to come back, um, floors three through six. We hope we'll follow relatively quickly once those cabinets and countertops arrive. And the end of October is our goal to get people, all of our tenants back in. We did lose a few during the process. There are some who decided that they were going to stay where they were because they did like where they had relocated. I will note that we had several who decided on their own or family had a chance to really observe them that they needed a higher level of care. So we did lose a few that way as well. Um, but we continue to communicate with the tenants through our Facebook page calls and letters to keep them updated and to give them an idea when they're going to be able to get back in. So it's coming together. And I'm told it's relatively quickly considering what we've been through. Yeah, that sounds fantastic. I, I mean, uh, it, it does seem quick. I haven't, you know, followed the whole recovery process of the fire before, but it just seems like everything came together just perfectly. What a fantastic job managing this. Um, and yes, that's so great that all of the residents will have the option to come back hopefully by the end of October. Um, so we're wrapping up a couple of quick things. Um, just wanted to remind you, I know Ted mentioned it earlier that fire prevention month and fire prevention week is in October. And that's a fantastic opportunity to um, utilize resources that are already kind of put together for you to engage your residents and the community and, um, and invite your fire department to, to come on as well. Um, it is also September National Preparedness Month. So uh, there is a link here um, for resources that you may be able to use um, for education and engagement with your residents as well and staff, community members. Um, there are some building fire resources linked here that you'll have access to as soon as this is posted on the HUD exchange. 
Um, and so this is really the final slide. I'm going to leave this up while I just take a quick look at the questions. And thank you for those of you um, uh, who've who've stayed on with us. Um, so the I know a bunch of questions um, sort of got answered. I think are foldable ladders still being used for multi-level housing facilities in case of fire? Um, so it is my understanding from conversations uh, with Ted and others um, that those are still being used in in uh, in cases of um, like this the lower level, right? You can't use the fire ladders for higher level um, buildings, but for like a second story unit or something like that, that they can be used. Um, are you aware of an apartment design called Access Plus? I personally have not. Are others on the call aware of that? Um, Ted, Fred? This is Ted, Thank you, this is Ted, Ted. Kasky. I, I am not aware of Access Plus. Um, next is where where should the housing authority keep record backups and where do the residents keep a copy of records? So, um, I mean, residents, I think that you can certainly have conversations if that's appropriate, um, but I think that those are individual decisions that the residents are going to keep for their personal records. Um, the housing authority, we do we do recommend that there are printed copies available and maybe multiple printed copies because if your um, if your central office, your corporate office is damaged and no access to those records, it's helpful to have another printed copy that can be accessed um, in another location. But as we mentioned earlier, it is also important to have uh, critical documents stored electronically and not just stored electronically, but organized in a way that they're easily accessed um, and not you know, not have just the information of where they're stored with one central person, but having that information shared among other um, leadership within the uh, housing authority, as well as, um, you know, building management or others who may need ready access to that. Uh, this says, accessible design, there's only one elevator. I think I missed part of this question. When the elevator breaks down, the fire department has to come and carry wheelchair bound residents up and down the stairs. Is, they, is there a fire elevator type design? Jody, do you want me to answer that? That would be fantastic. Sure, no, at this time, elevators during a fire are, are very dangerous because that elevator, if it's not the, the actual fire floor, can take uh, that person into a, a, a bad situation and put that person into even a, a more dangerous location. So as part of a, a fire safety plan, for individuals who have any type of disabilities with wheelchairs, they should have a safe location that they can go to where the fire department, when they get on scene, uh, can come and assist that person down. Uh, and a lot of times, once a, uh, a fire is under control, as long as that person's in a safe area out of the, uh, the elements of the fire and smoke, uh, if they are, are below the fire in a safe location, uh, that person can, can stay there until the fire department can remove them from the building. Thank you. Um, what material is presented to the housing authorities and residents to assist with preparedness? Is it the guidebook and or webinars? Um, so as I mentioned, the, the, it's currently called uh, PHA disaster preparedness, but because the amount of information and resources available have been so greatly expanded, um, the, the new uh, disaster preparedness guidebook will be renamed um, and it will be disaster readiness response and recovery um, and I know that the, that is currently being updated um, and I would anticipate that that's going to be available within the next few months so it will be a fantastic resource with um, all of the information we presented today and in other webinars um, links and all of that along with uh, a series of fact sheets that will be published. Um, so, so the answer to your question is is both. It was the guidebook and also the webinars. And so, when you do your own housing authority risk assessment, when you um, you know you'll identify those uh, disasters that you are most likely to encounter, whether it be wildfires, tornadoes, hurricanes, um, and so 
watch those specifically to hear about how um, how the response has been actual experience of case studies. Um, and then, you know, FEMA is, is on those ones as well, which is extremely helpful for um, uh, disasters that end up being uh, under a, mass, a major disaster declaration. Um, and so there will be a page on the HUD exchange that has these resources. And it's my understanding that there will also be eventually a HUD.gov um, page that has these resources. So look for those in the coming months. Um, our final question is, please define fireproof building. And for, uh, Ted, you did this so gracefully earlier. I'm going to ask that you answer this question as well. Sure. Fireproof building is a building whose structural components will not burn. Uh, think of a, a concrete high-rise building uh, in potentially one of your PHAs or in your municipality. Uh, if it's made of concrete, uh, the structure itself will not burn. However, even though it's a fireproof building, uh, the contents within the apartments or within the structure can still burn, such as furniture, uh, any type of tool benches, uh, any, again, clothes, anything that, that's inside of it. Whereas a non-fireproof building is a building that, that it's usually made out of structural components that can burn, such as wood, beams, two by fours, uh, et cetera. Thank you. Um, we did get one final question and that is how can we contact you with further questions? If you go to the HUD exchange and you, uh, you can search for the disaster readiness response and recovery webinar series, there is a link on there that you can email us um, questions directly. Oh, excuse me. So we have gone well beyond our time. Um, so thank you all for joining and thank you for staying. Um, and yeah, have a great afternoon.